the land by sense RNA, no RNA, sister, obviously no DNA cloning. Uh, so what, what did we use? How did we do research at that time? Well, there were Bunsen burners. And the Bunsen burners were used to heat and sterilize uh, flat balloons that we used for streaking bacteria on plates where bacteria could be studied colonies can be counted. There were things called microscopes, and there were things called even electron microscopes, where we could look at uh, DNA, uh, which was an advance at the time. Uh, how do we analyze nucleic acids, and how do we analyze proteins? Well, there were Beckman D spectral photometers, and Beckman uh, ultra-analytical and preparative ultra-centrifuges that we used to analyze what we were studying. Uh, we used little boxes for DNA on the hybridization to determine the relationships between the genes, where the DNA was affixed to nitrocellulose membranes and then solutions containing RNA and DNA that run over the membranes and collected and hybridized and the homology was examined in an attempt to determine genetic relationships quite separately from the methods that have been used for many decades for making genetic mapping. Uh, it was in this environment that her lawyer became interested as a postdoctoral fellow in the Adelberg's laboratory at Yale in restriction enzymes in 1964 published a paper and when he moved to UCSF in the Department of Microbiology in 1966, he continued his interest in restriction enzymes. As a postdoctoral fellow in the Jerry Hurwitz Laboratory at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Department of Molecular Biology, I was interested in bacteriophage lambda and in transcriptional control in lambda and uh, particularly in the sequence of gene expression in two halves of lambda DNA and worked out methods of sharing and separating fragments of lambda DNA to look at the segments of the genome and their role in the development of lambda. When I moved to Stanford in 1968, initially in the Department of Medicine, I was interested in antibiotic resistance, which was a problem at the time. Antibiotic resistance was something that appeared unexpectedly following the initial use of antibiotics in the 1940s. They had been thought that that was the end of infectious disease, but that resistant strains began to appear in Japan, and, uh, Europe, elsewhere <coughs> for resistance. And it was determined by genetic analysis that resistance uh, genes were encoded by extra chromosomal genetic elements called plasmids, a name that was uh, given by Joshua Lederberg some years earlier, that existed and replicated separately from the chromosomes. And many plasmids contain genes encoded for a structure called Swiss, which uh, I developed as a result of expression of plasma genes on the surface of bacteria. And it was the pillus that allowed the transfer of plasmids between bacterial <coughs> cells and thus the spread of resistance in populations of bacteria. Probably some of you don't know the bacteria have sex, but they do. And these pili are involved in the transmission of the plasmids between cells. Well, genetic studies had shown that plasmid maps, gene maps, were circular, in which there was a segment of a plasmid that was involved in replication and transfer of the genetic element that was linked to a number of resistance genes. And uh, so the question, one of the questions that I was interested in is how this all worked and how did they relate to each other? I've drawn plasmids in circles because, as subsequent work showed, that's certainly where they are. And there began to appear at the 
electron microscope photos, this one taken by Charles Brinton at the University of Pittsburgh, which is where Herb really received his uh, PhD, showing that in addition to his book, bacteria, on a electron microscope grid, in addition to the chromosomal DNA, separately here in the corner is a little DNA circle for the plasmid, uh, one of the plasmids that exists in that bacteria. So, one of the questions that I was interested in asking when I started my lab was, can antibiotic resistance genes carried by plasmids be isolated <coughs> and studied? Now, plasmids were a very unpopular area of genetic research at that time. Uh, in fact, at one point I looked up and saw that in 1968, when I started my laboratory, plasmids during the whole year were only 34 papers published in all of biology on <coughs> plasmid DNA. Whereas 10 years later, as a result of some of the work that Herb and I did, there were thousands of genes on plasmid, uh, papers published on plasmids. That time in the 1960s was the era of bacterial viruses. Or <coughs> phage bacteria. In molecular biology. And uh, this is a well known a book by Bruno Stender and others, Phage from the Origins of Molecular Biology. And there was good reason for the interest of molecular biologists, geneticists, and biochemists in phage, and that is because they have a particular property. In addition to the capsule, which capsule which carries the genetic information of the phage, they have a cell which allows them to inject the genetic information into the bacteria. And a single phage particle infected a single cell could produce thousands or hundreds of thousands of copies of itself. And thus the genetic information of a single infected phase could be cloned. And the DNA could be cloned and it could and then the properties of the uh, of DNA could be compared with the original particles that were used. And that was a, a special property that was recognized, the ability of phase to allow genetics to proceed through uh, fortuitous fact that uh, phase could be cloned. Well, to study plasmids, it was necessary to do the same kind of thing. First, it was necessary to isolate plasma DNA from cells as purified molecules, and this is something that my laboratory and other laboratories working concurrently were able to do. And this was uh, from a nature paper that we published about a year or so after I started the lab at Stanford, showing that a circular DNA of a large antibiotic resistance plasmid that we were studying called R65. So one of the things necessary in order to be able to study plasma genes is the ability to isolate plasma DNAs. And obviously, that was step one. And step two was to be able to get the DNA back into bacterial cells so you can clone the progeny of a single DNA molecule. And this was possible using a uh, procedure that had been developed for phage which we modify, or we can take plasma DNA out of cells, add magnesium chloride to the cells, and make the cells porous for the uptake of plasma DNA. The plasma DNA will be uptake, taken up by bacteria, and the bacteria that acquire plasma can be identified by growing the population of cells on a petri dish that contains an antibiotic. And the cells that have up taken up the plasmid, expressed antibiotic resistance, and thus could survive in various other bacteria that lack plasmid would not survive. So here was the plasmid that we were interested in studying. It contained multiple antibiotic resistance genes, 
and the question was how to separate the gene and how to take the plasma apart. The fragments of the DNA in the same way that I had done as a postdoc with bacteriophage lab genes. Well, this was just a bacteriophage family. So as I had done as a postdoctoral fellow, I started shearing the plasma DNA using a mechanical shear, taking this large plasma from 100,000 of these pairs and shearing it into multiple fragments, hoping that some of the fragments would attach to other fragments by normal uh, combination, and that the functions of the plasma that allow it to replicate would be able to recombine with genes for resistance and make new plasmas. But there were also better ways to join together DNA fragments. It had been shown by biochemical experiments that have been, were being carried out concurrently uh, Laboratorio Scaramella, for example, in uh, Golden Karana's lab, that you could ligate one end of fragments of DNA or take DNA that had complementary sequences and uh, combine the fragments. And also, as uh, Jensen and all, Jackson, Simons and Berg, and Lopin and Kaiser had shown, you could add a series of uh, T's onto one. DNA species onto the end of one DNA species a series of A's onto another and use the complementarity between A and T to join the two fragments together. But there was a much better way of doing it, which her and his colleagues had a major role in, in creating. Uh, it had using, let me just give you some background on this, uh, again having to do with plasmids. It was a graduate student named Bob Moshimori in the first lab who isolated the plasma from the patient at UCSF. And these plasma, uh, plasmids were known from the prior work to encode restriction enzymes. So Herb was interested in plasmids in the role in restriction, which was his primary scientific mission to study restriction and modification. And this particular plasma encoded an enzyme to terminate E. coli R1 or E. coli R1 and then it reacts. And then it was found initially by Vittorio Scaramella, who was a postdoc at Charles Lindbergh's laboratory. Whoops, we lost the image. Hello? Okay, sorry. Okay, it had been shown by Vittorio Scaramella and by Jack Burns and Ron Davis. Uh, working in biochemistry at Stanford and by Victoria in the Department of Genetics, that this enzyme cut in a very special way. It cut DNA so that it made cohesive ends. There were projections that were overlapping from each of the ends produced by this enzyme. Uh, so that it's sort of like a modified mortise and semi joint if one does woodwork and being able to join together fragments that were produced by cutting by this enzyme. And uh, this all came together for her and for me at a meeting that we attended in Honolulu, Hawaii in November 1972. Now when we think of Hawaii, we think of wonderful beaches and uh, pleasant winds and surfing and snorkeling and things like this. This was a meeting held at the University of Hawaii that was in a windowless room. And we sat in that room and listened to each other discuss science. These were some of the people from an old photograph that was taken. I guess this spirited guy is me and some of uh, Harper's colleagues and my colleagues at the time. And uh, at that meeting, I learned from her uh, of results that he published the same month in the PNAS, and that was the Joe Hedgepeth uh, and the collaborative paper Joe Hedgepeth, how it would have been heard, had reported the sequence of the uh, ends that were generated by ECO-R1. And 
I thought that was remarkable. They had found that the sequence was a hexanucleotide sequence, GAATTC, GAATTC in the pub ending, cleavage site on each of the strands of DNA uh, uh, was between the G and the A. And that was very exciting because uh, <coughs> Grand debate, as you can imagine, that a six nucleotide recognition sequence would occur once in every 4,096 base pairs. So you can take a, a, a plasma like a 100,000 base pair R65 plasma and cut it into a reasonable number of fragments, and there was a hope of being able to isolate intact genes by cutting it with this enzyme. Imagine if the recognition sequence were 10 nucleotide pairs, it would be cut much less frequency. If it were two or three nucleotide pairs, it would be fragmented to uh, more frequently. And it was practical to do experiments, but this was just the right size. And uh, her and I talked about his work, and he told me about his experiments, and I told him about what we had done with developing ways of getting plasma DNA back into bacteria. In a long walk that we took uh, in search of a late evening snack, uh, and we ended up in a Korean delicatessen. Delicatessen is on the window culture. Yes, Sam Falco, who was uh, one of the people that uh, on that walk as well. And so we went in, and here is a cartoon that appeared some years later in my Honolulu newspaper capturing the incident where here, presumably, is a uh, spirited guy uh, pushing down a corned beef pastrami sandwich. Here's her emphasizing the fact that DNA has two strands, or maybe more likely ordering another a couple of beers. <laughs> Charlie Brinton, Brinton, an electron microscopist who was on some mini sabbatical leave in my lab, and his wife Ginger, and here's Stanley Falco with his hands to his forehead, probably saying, Oy vey. <laughs> anyway, <coughs> we worked out a plan for experiments that we sketched on a napkin at the delicatessen, and I was asked to search for that map many years ago, but it was long discarded with the remains of the corned beef sandwich crust. <laughs> the, plan, the plan was to take this R65 plasma that we had been previously shearing into multiple fragments using mechanical shearing and to cut it by eco R1 and to get discrete fragments, to take them, put them in a test tube, allow them to reassociate. And if the four base pair overlap could hold them together to use DNA ligase to perfectly seal the name and then to use the procedure we had worked out to reduce the plasmids into bacteria to treat bacteria with calcium chloride and select for individual resistances on the plasmid uh, to get colonies that grew in the presence of individual antibiotics and hopefully to get a new plasmid or a mini plasmid that would contain replication functions that allow the plasmid to propagate plus uh, uh, some but not all of the antibiotic resistance genes. Well, Herb and I were very excited about the plan for the experiment, and I got back to Stanford and discussed them with a senior colleague, a biochemist, who uh, probably knew more about DNA than anyone I had ever known, but I won't mention his name. But uh, I can't understand it's very unlikely that anything meaningful will come out or interpretable will come out of such experiments. Uh, and from a biochemical point of view, I can understand that view, but I think we can see the power of genetic selection. And so we did the experiments. Uh, uh, as I've said, the discussion that Herb and I had was in mid-November 1972, and we began the experiments actually after the beginning 
new year. And uh, uh, as I think we all know, the experiments worked beautifully and happened ran very smoothly. And we were able to isolate, which was the first DNA clone model. It was a plasmid which we named PSC102, which contains some but not all of the antibiotic resistance genes of the large R65 plasmid plus the replication region. So that really worked. And uh, we were, I, I can share with you some of the feelings we had about the time. We had at the time, it was incredibly exciting as you can well imagine. Uh, it was sort of hard to eat and sleep. And the, the, one of the things that happened to work well was that a research assistant I had in my lab who participated in these experiments, Andy Che, happened to live in San Francisco. So in the morning, we would find the bacteria on the place and isolate the DNA in Annie, and she went home that evening into San Francisco, would carry it out, drop it off at Herb at Herb's lab, and he would then the next day uh, cut it with restriction enzyme. And there's something else that happened at that time that was important. And that's in January of 1973, Herb had visited Cold Spring Harbor. And he had learned from Joe Sanger that he had developed a procedure called hydroxyelectrophoresis, which enabled him to analyze the fragmentation of DNA in a very straightforward way. Prior to that, we had been analyzing it by electron which we also used in this first paper that Herb and I published together. But restriction enzyme analysis, uh, uh, restriction enzyme cleavages could be monitored much more easily by analysis. Uh, so there was a whole, a whole series of fortuitous events that uh, really coincided to help make this happen. So after we found that we could get this new little plasma 102. The real question is, is this a general procedure for cloning DNA fragments by uh, attaching the fragments to replication regions? And in order to do that, we needed what we then call a vehicle. Later on in the term, uh, Sidney Brennan offered was a vector. And much to my chagrin, because of the implications of vec the term vector from the point of view of disease and, and, and uh, hazard, the term vector was used and so it remained. But originally, we called the carrier molecule a vehicle. And the idea was to try to find a vehicle or vector that was cut once with the ecoR one enzyme and cut in a region that didn't interfere with its replication functions or its antibiotic resistance, and then to try to clone one of the resistance genes that we had previously fortuitously uh, cloned on the one of the into that. And in my uh, plasma collection at Stanford was a uh, plasma uh, which we had called PSC101, which was a small nine kilodase uh, DNA molecule that we found had the perfect properties to do what we wanted to do. And by late March, after about two and a half months of work, frenetic work, but unless it was remarkably fortuitous and short period of time, had uh, worked out the molecular cloning procedure. And in the paper that we then wrote over the next few months, we said, the general procedure described here is potentially useful for insertion of specific sequences from prokaryotic or eukaryotic chromosomes or extra-chromosomal DNA into independently replicating bacterial plasmids. Someone asked me this evening what was our eureka moment in this, and the person had been interested prior to our collaboration in using restriction enzymes to cut it, perhaps uh, cut the fragments which might be joined together before knowing about the cohesive properties of uh, ACO1 uh, fragments. 
cutting plasmids apart in order to study them, and it suddenly became clear that we could actually do this, and do this, and perhaps join fragments of DNA from other sources uh, to a vector and use this as a general procedure for DNA cloning. And uh, there were, on the other hand, some really important things that still needed to be solved despite this unique moment that Herb and I had. And that was um, so we thought to be cross-species barriers to DNA cloning. There was old work which showed that you couldn't uh, mate species that weren't closely related, and DNA from a particular species had a particular A, a plus T versus G plus C ratio, and it was characteristic of that species. And the idea that you can join DNA is, is one thing, and you can clone bacterial genes from E. coli, and E. coli was another thing. But there was a real uh, question about whether this procedure could be used to circumvent what were generally believed to be cross-species barriers at the time. And that was addressed in two ways. Initially, in my laboratory, by taking DNA from unrelated bacteria, E. coli and Staph aureus, and taking a plasmid that contained an antibiotic resistance gene, Cellular resistance from the staph plasmid and putting it, ligating it to the PSC 101 vector and putting it back and selecting cellular resistance. And those experiments showed that these species values uh, weren't relevant to the cloning of DNA in bacteria. And then Herb and I collaborated again to do a study. Uh, to show that this could be done with eukaryotic DNA. When DNA from the uh, South African uh, frog, as in his latest, called the South African claw toad, even though it was a frog, could be cut into fragments. It was ribosomal RNA. It was the DNA encoding ribosomal RNA. And those fragments could be cloned in E. coli, and the RNA could be expressed there. So this was, in fact, as published together with John Morrow and Andy and Howard Goodman and Bob Helling, who was an author, Bob Helling was an author on the original paper as well, uh, were able to show that this was a generally accurate procedure. Now, this sounds all happiness, but at the same time, there was a thing which sort of marred all of this, and that was, as some of you may remember, the biohazard controversy which existed at the time. There was the concern that the ability to put genes in a host where they ordinarily didn't occur or didn't belong would be hazardous. And one of the, I think this picture, uh, kind of cartoon which appeared in one of the popular magazines at the time, sort of says it all. We were building a DNA helix that was a serpent that would come down and destroy the people that were building it, presumably those around it. And when I saw this cartoon that didn't escape my notice that the guy who was carrying a piece of DNA that was being inserted was a bearded, bald guy. <laughs> and, okay, and that led to concern about the biohazard and as we all know, that was resolved by data to show that the hazards really weren't related to the procedure itself. Now, a key person in the biotechnology industry that I haven't mentioned at all is a man named Nils Ramers, who is here tonight. Nils, uh, I said to him, and I saw him earlier this evening, he might not recognize himself because he was a young man at the time of this photo. He headed the Office of Technology Licensing at Stanford at the time. And when Niels read an article that the New York Times had run about the work that Herb and I had published, uh, uh, Niels said, aha, this should be patented. And Stanford and CSF had a chance to obtain income from this. And Niels called me up after seeing that article and said, Stan, you know, the university should have this. Would you and her consider it? 
And I said, how can we tell? And I need supported research that depends on years and years of basic knowledge of DNA. And Niels explained the reasons why it was valuable. I called her, and her reaction was the same as mine. But he and I agreed to, for Niels to proceed. And uh, he got a person who died a few years ago from pancreatic seeing Bill Roland, who was a super patent attorney, to work with us in writing the initial DNA cloning patents, which were submitted, the initial patents were submitted one week prior to a year after publication. The time of submission precluded uh, issuance of a patent in Europe because the work had already been published and barely allowed patent to be uh, applied for in the U.S., but it was applied for it, I think, you know, and that patent and, and continuations were granted and eventually licensed to 470 licensees uh, through a strategy that Nails and others had brought up technology licensing. had one doubt that was a successful income producer for both universities. Well, in the next to last slide, I want to mention that uh, about some of the pioneer companies of biotech. Actually, the first company on the list, Cetus, was for before the work that Herbert and I did. It was formed not as a, a genetic engineering company, but it then subsequently used uh, some of the techniques that we had developed. And uh, as you know, uh, one of your scientists developed PCR, a wonderful tool which we use today. The first real biotech company was, as I think all of you know, Genentech, which was founded by Herb and Paul Swanson in 1976, followed by Biomed in 1978, and Genetics Institute in Celtic in the UK in 1980, and shortly afterwards by Genzyme in Cairo. 1981. Now, a number of people that were key to the founding of these companies are in the room, and I hope that in the general discussion we have, we'll make some comments about the early days of technology. I'm not going to mention the individual people's name with the fear of omitting someone, but I do want to mention the two founders of Genetic and show the Spawn's uh, statues that exist outside Genentech of Herb and Bob Swanson talking about the formation of that company. And with that, I will stop. Thank you very much. And turn to Thank you. 
down here that you, we made this huge thing we expected it to be watching it, but no, it was with the memory. And we looked and I said, oh my gosh, what's going on here? We should be able to see this. So I bought a microscope, a genetic, the first Genentex microscope I got. And I looked in the microscope and I said, oh my gosh, it's not the size, it's the solubility. The bacteria are spinning around and the protein is going on the different ends of the bacteria. And it's like that size. And, and I brought her pointer down. Look at this, look what's going on here. And he named these little bodies refractal bodies because in the, in the phase contrast microscope, you could see these little glowing bodies. And it was like little dumplings. This, oh my God, this is what is going to make it possible. This is going to make the next step. I mean, you have everything that you like, you fish, but no, the bacteria said, no, 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 we don't want this. We want it big. But it turned out they didn't need it big. They needed it insoluble. And so her, little Herbie Heineker over here, said, you know, we got <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
and I have discussed this with, with her lawyer, the real her. Um, <laughs> and that is that um, the fact that we were um, in the early stage very uh, interested in synthetic DNA and in oligos to make DNA. And the fact that we took this, this, uh, this technology and, and used synthetic DNA for our cloning purposes has helped Genentech enormously to sort of, um, yeah, beat the competition, for instance, with, with internet, that is described. The fact that we use synthetic DNA instead of the natural DNA from, from human sources um, sped up the research enormously and it made it a much more efficient way to, uh, to do cloning. And I am hopefully speaking for her too because I discussed with him uh, the fact that synthetic DNA was such an integral part of, of uh, Genentech's strategy helped it enormously to, to be successful. Okay? So, 
said to them that we needed to uh, announce this work. The scientists who were adamant that uh, the work had to be announced publicly. And we were going to do that next Monday. And Lily uh, said, you can't do that. Because uh, we are in the final stages of negotiating a consent decree with the Federal Trade Commission over our alleged monopolization of the market for animal insulin. And if the FTC finds out about this, uh, we will have a third party to our negotiation, and that will be the federal government. And I said, well, we have to announce it on Monday. And uh, so the executive vice president, Eli Lilly, and the general counsel got a, not the small corporate jet, but the 727 corporate jet. And they flew out to Los Angeles, rattling around like babies in a barrel on this airplane. And uh, by Sunday night, we had concluded the deal. And Bob Swanson, uh, who honestly you know, should have yielded some grace points to Lilly in the negotiation, but we really had them, uh, pulls out a warm bottle of champagne, pops the cork, and it's flat. <laughs> and fortunately, we did better the next day uh, uh, once. Uh, Dennis took the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I told you what Nils Raymer should just tell you. Nils has something to say. Nils, are you here? No. Would you like to say something? I'm trying to think of what to, to say, but it was really fun working with her and Stanley. Uh, when I saw the article in the New York Times, I called up uh, Stan and I said, this is interesting. Stan, I had known Stan before for this a previous uh, invention, and he said, uh, it's the best thing I've ever done. And uh, then it took a lot of convincing with Stan to let me uh, file a patent and so on. And that was a very exciting year uh, before we uh, licensed it. And I recall meeting with Tom and Bob when Tom looked like he was about 16 years old, <laughs> and uh, he said, I know you're trying to license non exclusively, but to really get this going, you need to give us a license for exclusive for just polypeptides. And I started laughing, and Tom started smiling and laughing. Bob never did laugh at that. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> Sneakers and a t shirt, and he never leaves the lab. 
But they were like, okay, this guy, let's see what he can do. In the meantime, before I got there, I had told Dr. Blopel that I was not going to do a postdoc with him. He told me, Glenn, if you go to Genentech, you'll be squashed like an ant. You're going to industry. And back then, industry was remote. You know, they weren't sure about, you know, academics going into industry. So I go there, and uh, of course, it changed my whole life. But the whole time there at Genentech, it was all about being the first. It was drilled into us about playing the NFL every day. You're not playing high school ball. You're in this, you're in the big leagues here. We gotta like get it going. So we were there at like six or seven in the morning, didn't go home at night. And occasionally I would get a, a note at two in the afternoon on Sunday from day. Glenn, where are you? I was probably in the, uh, in the bathroom or in the lab developing a gel. He wanted to know what the results were. But the thing is, it was so inspiring to go there and be involved with the team that cloned like the, the first genes in the entire world. And uh, that was my life there, so it was also a life-changing experience. Anyway, I want to thank you all for the, the great experience of being at Genetech and uh, standing there for the incredible changes they made. Honorary memberships are available. <laughs> Thanks again.